Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of ELO Heaven. I am joined by our resident Windows Defender survivor, Vu CSGO, and Alan Hender, the analyst who you all know and love for his up-and-coming YouTube content. I would say it's not even up-and-coming at this point. You're just kind of a, a staple now, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> Every pretty, day. Pretty frequent. So if you missed that, you should uh, check him out after you're done watching this. Welcome one, welcome all. So obviously, IEM Katowice just finished. And uh, we had some initial thoughts about the tournament. Before we get into the specific matchups, I was curious, uh, Alan, if you had any initial thoughts coming off of this tournament, if there's anything more like sort of um, pr one could perhaps call it like off topic or, or secondary to the games themselves, if you notice something from the broadcast or just something that you wanted to touch on that uh, maybe doesn't have immediate relevance to the matches we might discuss today. I think uh, in general, this is probably one of the tournaments I've been most excited about for a while. And I'm not actually entirely sure why that is. It might be because just of the IM Katowice name and obviously the history going back so many years and obviously majors back in the day as well. So I'm not sure exactly why it is. It might be the team lineup. I mean, having uh, all 16 teams being top 20 in the world is just an incredible thing to happen. And it was quite unlikely to happen with the way they had the play-in format and all that going into the group stages. It had to have a lot of results going the right way to end up with such a stacked field in the end. So. Overall kind of team lineup was incredible. Um, I thought the broadcast quality was really good um, by the end of the tournament. And so I'm not sure exactly why it is. It's probably a combination of loads of small factors, but in general, a bit like Cologne as well last year, this is just one of the events that stands out for me in this kind of period of online play when a lot of the tournaments do kind of feel like uh, just sort of, uh, it's just another tournament. And this one did feel a bit different. So that's probably the main takeaway for me. Vu, what did you think of the the broadcast? What did you think of I Am Katowice? Did you enjoy the very epic um, green screen that took off maybe like three quarters of Yanko's butt when he was wearing jeans? So the, <laughs> so the only the only downside about Kato was that um, the first like I think it was the the plans were it, it felt like there was like sixteen hours of gameplay content like per day like for for a viewer that's kind of tough to like pay attention to. And for someone that's trying to like watch most of the games, it's kind of tough. But if you're only watching the teams that you're interested in, which is I think most people, um, like I still watch League of Legends once in a while just to watch like Cloud Nine, for example. Um, that's that's still I think that's like a semi optimal way to do it. It's just unfortunate that the B and C streams weren't perfect. But once you got into the actual tournament, uh, it was really good. And what's actually interesting is, I mean, nobody really cares, but Cato is actually the that was the first event I believe that COVID hit last year. Yes, where it yes, was on land, but there was no crowd. And I remember the Reddit response; it was a little bit split. Like a lot of people were saying, "Yeah, it's kind of necessary," at least because like you can imagine how bad the headlines would have been if it was like gaming event causes COVID outbreak, yeah. right? Like that would have been a horrific outcome to uh to that situation. Um, but that was like the first event that that COVID hit. And then um, having it come around this year and it, you know, Alan's got it right. Like there was something special about the event. It wasn't just like every other event, you know, even, um, you know, there are some other events that have quite a few good teams, but this event was, I don't know. I don't know what exactly it was. It was, it, it was quite nice. Um, the only, the only interesting part that people, <laughs> the most interesting part for me was the uh, Reddit thread about Yanko and uh, his interview with uh, with Yakindo. Oh, okay. I follow those Reddit threads way too much. Okay, we can get a little Reddit moment in at the beginning <laughs> of the show then, because uh, Alan, you may not be familiar. We have a regular recurring segment on Elo Heaven where we um, punch redditors in the face with our words, and this the way that we're going to be doing it this time around is talking about the Yakindo thread, and. It seems like the OP of that thread had some sort of compelling reason. Like it was almost in jest the way that he said, like Yakinder smacks Yanko down or something like it was like a verbal takedown, like Ben Shapiro or whatever. And they tried to have something, some fun with that, with the title. And I think a lot of the posters took that very seriously where obviously y Yanko himself responded in the comment section of that thread. He was talking about how it was just a poorly worded question. Um, or a partly articulated point, and the question itself was, like, how are you guys essentially, um, how, are, how have teams not really figured you out? And he used an example of a round that Yakinder happened to have a very good explanation for that was related to a read against Team Liquid. So 
Um, Alan, I'm not sure if you watched this particular clip, but it was about a, a clip where Yakinder runs out stairs and seems to have no regard for anybody who could be checking him because he's got to read. Um, how do you feel like a more abstract sense so that we're getting away with from the specifics here? How do you feel about, uh, you know, as an analyst on a desk, asking a player a question about maybe something contentious where there is that like the tension there where, oh, do, do people think that you're a bad player because of X reason or Y reason? What do you have to say to that? Is that kind of like just an impossible scenario or do you think Yanko could have done better here? What's your take on it? Um, hmm. Did you is see it, the clip itself? This is a tricky question. Um, I think you can ask quite hard, at it, well, not necessarily hard hitting, but like you can criticize players in interviews and stuff, but you have to be very careful about how you phrase a question. Um, so perhaps in this case, it wasn't perfectly phrased, but if you phrase it correctly, if you put it in the right light, you can ask pretty kind of negative questions. Or, I mean, at Flashpoint, we, we in general, with how we did interviews with players, especially on Blindspot and stuff, we weren't, nobody was scared to ask, you know, why did you lose this game? What's going wrong here? Um, but we're all professional enough to ask it in the right manner, not right. just say like... <laughs> Why did you shit the bed here or something? <laughs> so in, the, in terms of this whole topic, yeah. Um, if you phrase it correctly, yes, it can be fine. Um, it's always dangerous to go at very in-game things like that because people might not realize, but like from the outside, it's really hard to tell exactly what's going on. And for example, I just sort of um, uh, package a lot, a lot of stuff into just like some like nebulous term of communication because it's just impossible to know exactly what's going on in the team or who's called this or what they think's going on. So yes, in general, it's very hard to see what's going on uh, actually inside of the team. So maybe choose stray away from exactly those sort of questions. But uh, yes, I, I, <laughs> I sympathize with the analysts in, uh, in this scenario. <laughs> What do you make of the response from Reddit Vu? I feel what's, like, um, what's the reason why you were so, so uh, interested? So with in the this? with the exact clip, with the exact clip, you can kind of manufacture that because I actually think that was like kind of a great question in that it got a, an answer that actually meant something. Most questions you get like it, it's not quite to the level of hockey where like if anyone's watched a hockey interview, it's like yeah, just get pucks in deep get them on the net, just, just work hard as a team, you know, just like put in the effort, you know, like you don't have canned responses to that level, but you, they get asked the same questions a lot. They get, they, they're ready to give specific answers when you frame it in a way. And you know, a player could take some offense to that. I'm not sure if he necessarily took offense to that. I didn't read too much into y Yekinder's tone. Um, it's more but a facial even, expression. He had this this facial expression where he was like, uh, "Of course, you idiot! Of course, I would do this." So, and he, maybe that's me I reading too I didn't far. Even watch his facial expression. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It just it gave a real response. Like yeah. that's an actual response. That's like something people might not have noticed. You know, if you just watch the game, you don't know if if he's got the info that there's three people B, right? But he's got that info. Um, now we know exactly. Um, and I still don't think there was anything wrong with Yanko's question specifically, although the phrasing can make it seem kind of derogatory. Um, playing like it's FPL is basically playing with full confidence, right? And you don't yes. expect a team like, I mean, Virtus Pro has got a bit more experience, right? But you don't expect them to play that confident where it's like, they got 3B, I'm going straight through the top con smoke. I know nobody's looking here. I know fall. And then he wide swings top stairs, like in the middle of the open looking CT, like the confidence in that. More experienced players don't have the confidence to do that type of thing where you could just lose your team the round when you've already got an advantage, but he's got the confidence for it. So I think, you know, people read a little bit too much into that. When it comes through these Reddit threads, man, I always like type out a response explaining something to someone and I'm like, fuck this. This is like, this is not worth my effort. Like, this is, this is not worth coming into this thread and having to respond for the next three hours, dude. Fuck that. Could it be uh, maybe like a new content that you're leaving on the table there? Could you make like a, a Vu replies to Reddit and have that be? Like I considered a new it actually. I did. Yeah. I did actually consider this like Vu versus comments or something because yeah. I get some fucking ridiculous comments. Like I got a bunch of comments on like I make four like this four level series. It's beginner, intermediate, advanced, professional, and I put sometimes my own gameplay in as the advanced gameplay, and it's like I'm not fucking amazing but i'm good enough to be you know like 2500 elo like i'm okay i would say that's advanced level right and people are like lost all respect for you when you put your own gameplay it's like what the excuse me like what the fuck 
yeah if you learn something from it then who where does it matter what the source is exactly like i don't get that either but yeah you so you could definitely be doing that is all i'm saying you can make that like a weekly installment just serving serving them up I'm just saying it's it's potential and, and, and with the rate that alan's been churning out the content he might just get there before you know since we've been talking about <laughs> so you never know yeah there's like it, a new know. alan hender video like once a week or something or like once every couple days i mean I have is about a two day turnaround time if I mm. really want to do it quickly. So, fuck, it's a lot I of can, effort I... to put out those videos, too. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, like, for people that, that are watching and stuff, like, whatever number you think it takes to make any piece of content, times it by 10 and you'll be about right, uh, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> probably about, it probably takes me about two hours per minute or an hour, per, maybe an hour and a half per minute of content to actually make that um, from conceptualization to the end. So, Yes, but in terms of making a, a show on Reddit comments, I mean, I've read my fair share <laughs> over the uh, <laughs> over the years. I mean, every single like one that's just like some ridiculous smoke that nobody would ever use, and it gets four thousand oh. upvotes. Like, I could make I an make a video YouTube on this, series man. about that. <laughs> I want like I've I've like got this in the plans to make a video series on that where it's just like the best of Reddit smokes. Like they're all yeah. so bad. Like someone made a a, a balcony Molly on Inferno balcony. Um, from like arch side basically and it's like oh you can throw it from here and then someone's like here's a better one you can throw from in middle from safety and he's like yeah that one works too they're both good and i'm like no 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 they're not both good like this 1500 upvote volley is dog shit <laughs> if only the whole world was organized according to upvotes we might finally have justice served what I want to talk about now, since we lingered on the point of Kinder specifically, it actually is a nice segue into the final where I felt like, my, me personally, uh, it looked like VP just capitulated against Gambit and I am Katowice. I think the grand final, my own personal take, it didn't feel like a grand final in terms of the, the caliber of competition. The first map was actually really exciting because there was obviously VP getting off to a really running start on the CT side, then have switched, Gambit make this massive comeback, and then it's on VP to get, win every round in a row to win it in regulation. It's a much more narrower victory than it even looks when you see 16-14, if you see like the distribution of rounds and how they got there. So I'm curious as to where VP went after that because that was really, it looked like their last stand in terms of being competitive against gambit on overpass they had a bit of a comeback in the works but it was eventually dismantled and it was always a little bit far-fetched looking at the score line so what, what are your thoughts on the final alan how did you feel like that one worked out it was a bit underwhelming i mean i think that's very safe to say um even if you go from the angle of you know we haven't got all the best teams here you know we're not going to get the best viewership we still would have expected these were the two teams that got through the bracket got through some really tough teams you still expect right. a high caliber level from both the teams so irrespective of where they are ranked in the world or whatever we still should have expected you know at least a close series or some really great cs um i think verse had a lot of problems in this game uh, in this match, for sure. I think Virtus Pro as a team, um, they might actually be the best terrorist team in the world at the moment. Um, certainly, statistically, so, um, stats-wise, I'm pretty sure they are the best terrorist team in the world. But in this series and other series as well, they've had a lot of problems on the CT side. And I think in this one, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, I think it's 21 rounds they got in four maps on the CT side, which is averaging five rounds per map on the CT side, which obviously is never going to be good enough. And like in this game, for sure, their CT sides let them down a lot, and they just weren't able to like hold themselves in the game and get onto the T side and let you know your kind or bust or whatever go to work. So that was for me the biggest takeaway of, from this kind of final was that VP in their kind of we'll talk about it later on. It was like T side was where they're really hammering these top teams, and maybe CT sides had more issues that it took a gambit potentially to exploit. And I guess also in this matchup, you've got the domestic matchup angle, yes. which might have played a factor, but irrespective yeah um i do think this final was more so vp underperforming than gambit performing but obviously credit to them for actually you know winning the tournament and all that and shiro great event from him what do you make of it vu how much of the final did you end up catching um you know the one thing it always happens like this where you get some upsets earlier on in the tournament um, I mean, it's not even early on in the tournament, but earlier on in the tournament, then you get to the final and you've got these two teams that people don't necessarily look like as world beaters, you know, Virtus Pro is kind of getting there, but you don't really look at, you know, it, it's still not to the point where it's like, if you beat Astralis, you beat Vitality, it's like a, a, 
a feather in the cap, I think is the phrase where it's yeah. like, you know, you've got something there and then you go into the final and it's just not the same, you know, name brand value, the same punch. Um, and there was, I don't, I don't think CS was played perfectly in the final either. The one thing that I think is kind of good from, from Gamut that means good things is that, you know, even with Shiro not having, you know, statistically his most amazing performance of all time, you know, they're still doing great things. They're still level. I mean, they just dominated. Right. Um, one thing that's interesting actually that I wanted to look into for you, Kindar, is that he's what what's crazy to me, this is kind of just a tangent, but what's crazy to me is when you look at players that have like top rating players, um, players that are looked at as like some of the best in the world, almost I feel like almost none of them are quite Yakindar esque in that he's almost always in every series he's in got the most deaths, unless his team dominates, like just destroys a series. He's almost always got the most deaths on either team. And he's still coming up with like top rating a lot of the time and, and just doing amazing things. And the rating isn't meant for players that die a lot. Like rating is like pretty heavily based on your KDR. Um, and just like surviving. So you have players that do well, like Shiro does really well in the in the rating factory because he just never fucking dies. Um, and Yakindar just does amazing things with you know just unbelievable numbers of deaths, which I, I saw I saw some people talking about that as like a, a net negative. I think it's incredible that he's you know done so well uh given his style. Yeah, I, I think the thing about Yakinder for me was when I was watching, especially that Vertigo game, and maybe this is confirmation bias because I'm starting to look at Yakinder a lot more when he's on his T side. But one of the things that I noticed in that particular matchup when Yakinder eventually did go on T side, one of the reasons why VP had to make a comeback to win that map in the first place is because Nafany was actually able to counter that. And that's really interesting for me as the IGL of that roster, him like essentially putting himself in a positions where he's taking those duels against Yakinder on the CT side, where normally you would want to almost avoid him or maybe not give him enough space, but contend him with more than one player. A lot of the times it was Nafany to hold almost solo on that A ramp position. And I'm curious as to if maybe that was just a symptom almost of like the fact that eventually Yakinder almost got figured out by Nafany specifically. At least that seems like what Nafany was trying to do on the CT side. To what extent he was successful, I'm not 100% sure because I did end up looking, obviously we didn't see too many T side successes from VP after this map. So it didn't end up looking like something you could track. But yeah, at this point, what are we, what are we feeling about Yakinder's style specifically and how it morphs them? Because I, I feel like he needs to have success in order for VP to win the, the majority of the T rounds that they win, but he can't be the only player that does that. Obviously like Jane can clutch. We've seen that time and time again, obviously Buster, as Alan mentioned earlier is like clearly a solid fundamental player that can maybe back up Yakinder in these entry paths. So Alan, what, what do you, what do you make of Yakinder and how his impact has been so far? Yakinder is a, is a tricky one. I think the first thing to say about Yakinder is the way you should like people should think about him is forget about Yakinder just as an individual and think about how he like how he's used by Vertus Pro and how he actually factors into their system because that's just how the game is played. But um, um, like for Yakinder, I mean specifically at Flashpoint, he was a player that was quite polarizing um, in the sense that he might have been putting up some really great numbers, especially in the group stages, but. I get I for example when I watched him play I could still see a lot of mistakes which was definitely always going to happen for a player like him of his experience level the spots he's in he gets a lot of space both sides he's going to make errors so Yakinda is a really really tricky player because in some aspects he's very very good clearly on a mechanical level clearly like entry fragging a bomb site he might be one of the best players in the world when we get to more tricky stuff man up man down playing late round scenarios communicating maybe he has more issues and potentially in the final, you maybe you saw him a bit kind of exposed as a player that is nowhere near as well-rounded as some people might think he is, just by factor of his experience level. So with Yakindar, I think in terms of his role, what he does for the team, he's absolutely fine. And as Vu mentioned, for a player that's got that many deaths, which means he's an entry fragger in English, <laughs> that's just what that means. And on the CT side, he's very aggressive. He dies a lot anyway. Um, so Yakindar, he plays his role fine. And... If he's having issues late round and stuff like this, maybe it's on, you know, in-game leader and coach to fix that. So with your kinder, you know, I don't want to say he's, he's bad or anything because for his experience level, for, you know, all of this sort of stuff, he's definitely an incredible player. Um, but he's still someone that I look at now and I'm like, you know, give this guy a year of really good experience to round out his game and then he'll be absolutely sick. But certainly in some aspects, he's incredible. And, you know, 
T side entry fraggers and opening up bomb sites um, when you give him the space. You know, he really might be one of the best in the world right now. Yeah. I've actually got him in in two of my videos recently because um, when I look at him mechanically, he is unreasonably good. And um, his his cross like for someone that's you know you wouldn't necessarily think of crosshair placement as that that important, but like I see so many kills he gets even from low health because he just like people swing around the corner, he just taps away, gets the free kill. Um, I feel like the question is like how how good can Yakindar potentially be in in a year's time? Um, like do you do you have any prediction where you think he's going to end up? Is he going to be the next electronic or? I don't know. Um, the problem <laughs> is that, you know, a team like Vertz Pro won't have the best support staff. And Jame as an in-game leader probably isn't going to be the most uh, experienced in, like, teaching a young player like Yakinda. I mean, Jame probably for himself is still learning a lot about top-level competition and how you, like, approach playing these top teams and things like this. So... I don't know is the answer. I think if they did get consistently, I mean, hopefully from like this will result, they get some good invites to tournaments. But if he consistently was playing the best teams in the world for a year, I think he could be a really good player. Um, the things I have still hesitate a little bit on is that I haven't seen enough from Yakinda to think he could be an incredibly good like cerebral player and more of like, uh, like, uh, like, do helping with the mid rounding, for example, or on CT side calling a bomb site. Like I just don't know for a player like Yakinda if he could get to really high level with that sort of stuff. So um obviously signs are promising. And even though this final was a bit underwhelming, he still had a very good event in general. So he plays his role really well. So I think he could be, you know, he could definitely be one of the best players in the CIS region in a year if he gets the top experience. But there's a lot of questions about how you actually like build him out to be a more complete player. And I'm not sure a team like Vertz Pro does have the best support structure in place to help a player like Yakinda learn. So he might have to learn it a lot from trial and error just playing the top teams. Yeah, I, I see a lot from Yakinda in um I see a lot of what I used to think of as prime apex, like 2014, 2015 apex, um, with just really really crisp like mechanics and, and movement. Um, but I feel like you know, he's, he's, I'd say he's at a higher level than Apex was back then, but I see a little bit of, of similarity. Um, and the trouble is always kind of bringing that into the next level. And, and like you're saying, becoming more of a cerebral player, um, because sometimes people like people like that, they get too stuck on one style. And especially I think if you're playing in an online era in CIS region, I feel like it's even more likely where you just kind of play the same style and it works and so you just keep doing it and then eventually you just kind of get stuck on that and you never get to the next level so it can be kind of tough i mean yakindar's kind of over aggression is one of the things that have made me somewhat dislike watching vp but at the same time i love watching vp because it's it's great and it's like not great at the same time um yeah, this is a bit it, of a change of of tone it, from you, Vu. Yeah, it's, the last it's, two it's, times you were very. Yeah, down I mean, on. like, here's the thing. I I I love watching it, but at the same time, I don't know, man. I hate watching it. It's 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 hard to it describe, man. It's hard. It's hard to describe. It's a complicated. I think I think actually for Vertus Pro, when they play like the top European teams, so like Astralis and Liquid, I think they make a very very good series because they do play a bit of a different style. They play aggressively. They're very proactive on both sides. I think when they play a Gambit or another, maybe not Na'Vi, but a Spirit might be as well. I think you kind of, when you get two teams that are quite similar in this style, very aggressive individuals, very proactive, not always making necessarily the best decisions, then it can fall apart and the game actually looks a lot worse. But I do think Vertus Pro against, like in the Astralis and Liquid games, for example, yes. I think they were very exciting to watch when you when they're playing teams that play more kind of ABCCS or whatever, you'd, however you'd call it. Um, so I do think that's a potential angle with Vertus Pro that uh, the kind of the... The more fundamentally strong their competition, I think they actually make for better games rather than a gambit, which is going to be a bit more free flowing and a bit more uh, kind of, you know, um, they're going to be throwing curveballs and all that. So yeah, that might be a reason that you're a bit inconsistent on how you think about Vertus Pro. Uh, yeah, as a, it's, as a team uh, it's to actually watch. interesting that you mentioned that because I, I know um, Kerrigan on, I don't know, he was on some interview. He he mentioned uh, like a year or two ago that you know to beat Astralis, you don't play Astralis style you don't try and go more slow which is kind of like what liquids approach was yes. you go more random you you take more gambles 
Um, you do more, you, you know, like um, Stanislaw style where you're just kind of like 4-1, you kind of just explode into an area like this type of thing. You do more of that. And it's like nobody, it almost feels like teams just didn't like listen to that. And now like, and, and you now you have a few teams that, you know, Astralis is on the downswing admittedly, right? But I think teams are kind of, they're teams like CIS teams that kind of naturally do that type of thing naturally have um pretty good records against astralis and i'm hoping maybe some teams start to realize that like you know liquid you don't just slow it down and try and play into astralis's style it's not it's not going to go that well for you yeah well the kind of the problem with liquid specifically is that they, they had a tough time going well against any of the teams that they were less familiar with at this tournament i feel like and Obviously, they were able to bounce back against FaZe Clan much earlier in the tournament uh, with Kerrigan's debut not being super successful, which we touched on in the previous episode. But looking at them in the semifinals, I, I wonder if Liquid is one of those teams that we, we kind of have a back and forth on where some teams need to play themselves into form and the more matches they get in these official brackets, the better off they'll be. So if they have to go through quarterfinals because they lose to Navi and then they have to play Astralis in this example or whatever the case may have been, then maybe that actually helps them out a little bit and they can like play themselves into semifinal form where they didn't really put up much of a fight against VP. The matches were close in the scoreline sense, but it never felt like the rounds that, especially on CT side, that Liquid won were due to like an adaptation. It was more their star fragger, like firepower showing up, at least for my money. So when we look at that semifinal for a moment and we touch on the fact that obviously VP found a ton of success on T side in that series, I think this is kind of more food for thought regarding Alan's point about the ABC CS kind of falling apart when you, you know, ex examine it on the, under the microscope of the CIS play. So wh what did you make of this particular series, Vu, since I know you're the resident liquid guy over here, uh, as we touched on previously, because <laughs> you had a, a spectacular tweet when liquid lost the series where you said you just woke up <laughs> and uh, liquid won, right? That was your, your tweet. So. I actually, what happened with that is I just woke up and it was like 12, 12. And then I watched the last few rounds or I don't know. I don't know what the score was. It was like the last few rounds of the game, and I watched the last few rounds, and uh, and then it was over, and I'm like, wow, fuck, they just got stomped. This is actually, like, one of a few series that I haven't watched in this tournament. I didn't watch okay. this series. You didn't watch it? I didn't though. watch this one. You I just watched the it. last moments of Liquid final, just rolling <laughs> yeah. over. And... Okay, so, yeah. so I, did, Alan, I give just us watched the last few minutes of it. Yeah, it was an interesting series. I mean, I even, after I saw the veto, I tweeted out saying that like, I look at this video, I'm like, all three of these maps are verse pro maps. They're like, even though they don't play that much Mirage, like T-Side, these guys are born to play like T-Side Mirage going for mid-control. <laughs> they are like the best team. They're definitely the best team in the world are going aggressively for mid-control Mirage. It's like ridiculously good at using the spawns and stuff. Like go for like aggressive entries in mid. So yeah, this series was, it was a bit perplexing because even I, I thought this was a real 50-50 after I saw the veto. And then to see a, see Liquid come out, um, especially after the Navi series, where they looked consistently at a high level in that one, outside of one of the maps, and then to come into this one and kind of get blown out, especially on Dust Two, was very surprising. And I think it just speaks to um, like it's just kind of impossible that Liquid could have that much depth to their game, considering a recent in-game leader swap and put, bringing Fallen in, and you know, very. Uh, uh, questionable practice that say in the NA region until they could get into Europe and all this sort of stuff. So um, I think the depth of this team was always going to be a bit questionable. And in this series, I think when they're playing a team that's very different to some of the other teams they've played and beaten, um, I think they got exposed a bit for not being quite as much depth. Because when you play a Verts Pro, they like they do such strange things or the way they play on CT side, even so proactive, like to just like group at random times and just push in areas. If you don't know that's coming, if you're not used to calling around that, you're just going to get like absolutely fisted. Like <laughs> you're not going to have a clue what's coming, and you're not going to have a chance. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, you could you could criticize the the like the preparation on something going into this series. I mean, being real, they probably thought they were going to play Astralis in this series, um, so they probably prepped for Astralis in their four days uh, more than Virtus Pro. So they maybe they got blindsided by that as well, but. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not terribly surprised they lost. I'm definitely surprised the fashion, and I think it probably speaks more than anything to um, the depth of the team. And they do need longer. And Fallen still transitioning to back to being a caller at the top level is still probably going to need some more time. But outside of this game, you know, I'm still pretty happy with Liquid's tournament. I think they're on a pretty good resurgence run at the moment. 
Yeah, I mean, after some the fact that... Some might say they could get top two. Some, some, might, some, some might say they could end up a top two, you know? Yeah, so, some may have said that in some clip somewhere <laughs> of the show <laughs> when Tea Time was antagonizing Vu. <laughs> so, what, well, what I want to know, it looks like right now your prediction's way better than his considering Faye's debut with Kerrigan and it doesn't go very well for them. But when it comes to Fallen, the fact that Fallen comes in and obviously he's now IGLing officially at the very least, maybe it was always the case. We never know with these kinds of press releases. The fact that, uh, as Alan says, they're probably prepping for Astralis, and when they're prepping, a lot of the prep that they're doing is probably not going to be anti-stratting to the same extent when they're trying to instill the new collar. So they're probably doing maybe a lot of scrims, if I had to suggest. And at that point, they're more working on their own game. That does set you up to be completely demolished by somebody like VP if you don't already have the fundamentals to fall back on that actually work against that play style. So... I can see how the, the match certainly fell apart, especially when watching it. It does look like their CT side didn't make the sufficient adjustments. Uh, it doesn't really feel like they contested for a lot of the map control in the early stages of the game. And VP are one of those teams where they're not happy just taking one bit of map control like some of the other teams are. If they have one like map control in mid, then they're going to try to go for it in con or window or ladder room or something. And especially in Mirage, it was kind of obvious that that's what they were doing. We never really saw an audible called by Liquid to try and resolve that issue and try to maybe release the pressure there. Or if we give up one area here, we've got to give up the other area there. A lot of opening picks went VP's way. So ultimately, it seems like it was almost a a moot series at that point when you when you sort of analyze all the parts. But w were there any interesting takeaways from either of the maps that you noticed, Alan, about how maybe like if Liquid had made like one or two adjustments, they could have at least taken it to a third map or seem more competitive? Or was this sort of more of a blowout in that sense? I think the their, their CT side on Mirage was very surprising because I have watched a bit of Liquid playing on Mirage and they do they call a fairly good c team rise they make some good decisions they have some really versatile players they have you know even fallen if he's not 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 a top orper he knows everyone knows how to orp c team mirage and all the options and they even do stuff like if stewie's top spawn for like the quick cat jump he'll just orp that round and just go for it and shoot around the top mid smoke and all that so like their c team mirage theoretically is a lot of pieces that they can use Potentially in this series, as you alluded to, you know, in that Mirage game, maybe they didn't call a fantastic CT side. Maybe they aren't prepped enough to know that, you know, I could tell you straight up that when you're playing VP on Mirage, they're going to go aggressively for mid control almost every single round. They have a good spawn and they're going to use a fast window smoke and stuff like that's just what's going to happen when you play Vertus Pro. Maybe they didn't know that. I'm not sure. Maybe. I mean, as much as you can prep, there's not really a substitute for playing on the server against some of this stuff. Like, it's all well and good having a plan, but when your kid uh, swings around the corner with Pika's advantage and domes you, like, <laughs> maybe your plan goes out the window and all that. So I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened for them in this series. Um, it'll be interesting interesting to see, but at the end of the day, with, like, a with like a single limb playoffs, like, they did only lose one series. Uh, <laughs> True. At the end of the day, to a team that plays very differently to the, t to the kind of, to the sort of Astralis style they might have been expecting to play this deep in a tournament. So, yeah, um, I don't know. Dust 2, Dust 2 was much more of a blowout. I just don't... I mean, CT Dust 2 is a bitch anyway to, like, adapt. Like, it's so hard. And I think, like, I think teams will learn a lot from watching Verts Pro and Spirit, for example, at this tournament and how they play CT side, getting aggressively into mid when they lose a lot of map control. Um, so, I don't know. They've got a lot to think about, but uh, hopefully they... Uh, fix some issues and we can see a more consistent liquid in the tournaments to come. That it's also help. possible it kind of hurt them that there were every CIS team in the playoffs, which means in theory, your practice partners against CIS teams could actually be lacking, which might be the type of team you'd want to practice against if you want to play against Virtus Pro. But again, if they're if they're expecting Astralis and then they get Virtus Pro, that can be problematic. And one thing that that's, um, Relevant to point out, I think, is that, you know, um, I was listening to the HLTV Confirmed podcast and Kerrigan was talking about the struggle of getting into like match mindset um, when you're when you're going into these events. Um, and he was saying like the night before he's got an event, sometimes he'll like unplug his mouse and keyboard and like move it to the side. So like he plugs it back in and he's in tournament mindset, which is like a cool idea. Um, and I think the idea of like playing the like not having any breaks can help you kind of maintain a mindset and then you have a break and you go into the semifinals and maybe you kind of get out of that type of thing um and that can probably hurt you a little bit as well i think um more so than um you know playing an extra series 
Yeah, actually, something we should point out here is it's like infamous in this tournament format that the winner of the groups almost never wins the tournament. And uh, a potential yeah. reason for that is they come into this semi-final cold against a team that's just normally fought a really kind of hard-fought quarterfinal and they're like match ready and ready to go. Um, so you could ask questions about this format of whether it really enables the team that skips to the semis to always actually have the best chance. I mean, maybe they should start playing them on the same day so the person in the quarterfinal gets the disadvantage of playing a game straight after the last one. I don't know, but uh, yes, I think the, it's definitely I think a story that's played out in all that. of these events. It's always, I mean, the Spirit and Liquid did not make the final and it's played out once again. That, the, uh, know, the Reddit the response and, and the player response to uh, playing in the same day would not be great. I know players hate that type of thing, but that would be yeah. a, a relevant, like a relevant dimension, advantage, especially when you're playing online and, and when you're playing, um, when you're, when you're playing on LAN, I could see the same day things being more um, damaging. Online, I feel like maybe it's a little bit less. Um, but yeah, it's tough for teams when you go into that. And especially like, I don't know, especially when you get in these series where if you have a series where it's like clear who's going to win, you know, you have Astralis versus, I don't know, some shitter team like Vitality where it's just going to be like two sixteen O's, right? Like, and you know who's going to come out first. I feel like that's like a definite advantage. But then you have VP versus Astralis and you can kind of expect Astralis to win that, but you can't even be 100% sure given the form Astralis went to the, the quarters with. And so you you really don't have that much of an advantage just waiting in the semis. Like, you don't really even know who you're playing, you know? One of the things that I want to track here is we were talking about this before you joined us, Vu, at, when you were in Windows Purgatory. And one of the things that we talked about, it was the fact that we had an issue come up where... I was using it as a bit of a conversation point of when lands return, where would we like put some of these teams? And that's going to be like, we'll, we can go a little bit more in depth into that a little bit later in the episode. But one of the things that Alan had mentioned in his breakdown of the Mirage on, on uh, CT side, Mirage liquid is that, you know, you kind of shoot around smokes and it's just become, it's one of those other things that has developed like online era has developed. So people are using peakers advantage to the fullest extent, which is what we see with you kinder. But we also have other things developing in this meta. Um, one of the things I'm noticing is people just spamming smokes. I feel like there's more smoke kills than ever. And it can't just be that we see the smoke icon in the kill feed because the valve added that. It has to be more like there's I feel like it just has to be more that people are getting better at reading the positioning or the tracers or whatever. And I'm seeing a lot more of those frags, especially on maps uh, like m mostly Inferno and I guess Vertigo as well, where smokes are going to be deployed at, at these choke points in the middle of gunfights at times. But I was curious as to what your guys' thoughts are, because for me, and maybe this is an unpopular opinion, I think that there's probably like nothing Th that I would get excited for less than somebody just spamming through a smoke and finding a couple headshots. It's like, I mean, it, by definition, it is unexpected, but it's like the shittest way to win around for me. It's almost as bad as, as Kaylee jumping and RNGing your way to a headshot when somebody's planting the bomb on Dust 2 A site. Like, that's probably the worst way to win uh, any round for me, my money. And I, I just wish that was removed. Like, if you boost up, that's fair. That takes coordination and positioning and, and reads. But if you're just jumping and RNGing, it's pretty despicable. So I'll throw this to you, Alan. Maybe you can be the positive side of my negative Nancy on, on the smoke kills. First of all, is it even true that there are more in your estimation? And second of all, what do you think of, of the abundance, if that is the case? I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if there are more. Um, not the when they had the radar bug and stuff, I think yeah. it was worse, to be honest. Um, so I don't know. I think I think we see a lot at the moment of people sitting in smokes when they fade and just like <laughs> yeah. like fifty fifty it and see what happens. It's not even fifty fifty, right? Because there's that yeah. slight advantage you have when you're inside the smoke. You give visibility back first so or whatever. I can I, I can explain that the mechanic behind that is sure. when the smoke's going out, they have this like last puff of the smoke. If you've noticed, like the smoke is just about out, and then it gives you like a last super black cloud, and it's almost like sitting in nade smoke. It's just you can see out of it perfectly, but you can't see into it because it gives us a little like fucking dying last breath, and it's it's a pretty clear advantage. Uh, I'd say it's like seventy thirty. Yeah, so I think you see that a fair amount, but like players on CT side are used to like jiggling a smoke anyway to get to be if in case someone pops through it. So right. you're not going to see it that much play out anyway. So I don't know. Um, I mean. If you want to go on this kind of angle of is it bad that kills through smokes and stuff, for example, for a long time, like A site Vertigo was just like 
throw the smokes behind default and then everyone spams and tries yep. to get the bomb down and then hope you get two kills and then retake like <laughs> that's obviously garbage yeah like nobody wants well, to vertigo in general that. right obviously garbage to be honest it's not quite as bad anymore but <laughs> that oh, this... side was, yeah, yeah. was terrible for the longest time um so i don't want to see that so much but mm, i don't think it's a massive problem i think we've got got, got other issues that might need patching so yes I can, I can, I can live with the number of smoke kills at the moment. I think. What do, what do you think, Vu? Where do you come down on this debate? This hotly contested I haven't, debate. I, I haven't noticed too much of like the increase in smoke kills. I've definitely seen people are like fucking savants when they are shooting through smokes, though. It's like just maybe it's the maybe it's the the blast challenge map where you're like spinning around <laughs> shooting through the smokes and shit. Because like as soon as someone takes a shot through a smoke, it's like instantly snapped to their head. I feel like it's unbelievable when I'm shooting through a smoke. Man, my gun does not go to their opponent. It's like there's it's like there's a brick wall blocking my shots, but not the enemy shots. It's unbelievable. Um I they really gotta get rid of the, the phasing through smoke thing. Um, where it's just like you sit in it, the smoke goes down, nobody can be on the other side because they're gonna die. It's like it's kind of a joke. I mean, it's kind of made it, it's it's really up the the value of half wall smokes on on inferno because you don't need to do anything after a half wall smoke you just oh the half wall smoke's going down everybody fucking party over here getting the smoke oh look we got top banana control like it's it's dumb it's it's really dumb to me uh that tilts me like that's that shouldn't be a thing spamming through smokes whatever it's like not exciting it's like um it's really not it's really not exciting. I remember like one of the one of the most hype moments was Liquid versus Astralis on Vertigo. I think it might have been from the major with the surprise Vertigo pick where like Naf ran straight through this smoke and just destroyed uh can't remember who it was, like straight through the smoke and Ivy and just destroyed someone and I was like, "Oh, that's so hype." How unhype would it have been if they just smoked like peeked out and spammed him through the smoke like in Ivy? It's like <laughs> that's boring. But I mean, it's just it's CS. They just got to get rid of the phasing through smoke shit, though. Something Alan just brought up, though, that I remembered from one of his tweets was that he's um, Stockholm syndromed into thinking that Vertigo is a good map or better than it used to be. So uh, let, let's it's go. better than it used to be. <laughs> I guess inarguably, yes. But you, I think you said something to the effect of like, I'm actually excited to watch some Vertigo matches now or not leaving them completely disgusted anyway. So <laughs> let, can we can we go deeper on this topic a little bit? Because I am a firm Vertigo hater, especially since a lot of my content is actually geared towards custom maps. I could rattle off like five maps that would be significantly better for competitive play at the highest echelon than vertigo and would be much more balanced and just from the get-go and obviously i'm not saying they're perfect they would all need some changes i'm sure maybe especially towards performance but even beyond that if we just look at vertigo is it not just so infuriating that almost every round you're going a what's your take in general <laughs> i won't make this an unfair poison the well thing but what's your take on vertigo in general right now just so we have all our cards on the table alan well i'd say in general like the i like having a map that's like two levels is never like it's just fundamentally a bad idea like the map would be much better if you flipped the bottom level from the first place and made it like off the other side so it's still linear um it'd just be a better map um in my opinion um because there's just so many stupid things with like sound in cs is terrible for mm. different elevation and stuff it just doesn't work uh, you can't tell if they're mid or they're running to the b site from down underneath and stuff like that so yeah i mean i think um as teams get better at like working for ramp control and stuff, um, it, Virgo's got a lot better in that sense in, than, than even six months ago, um, where teams now are much smarter about using their nades. They don't just smoke the ramp every single round and think that's actually like good. Um, <laughs> they actually use their late nades properly. People are learning now that you like you want to play aggressively and take duels on the ramp instead of just like trying to take it because you just can't at CT. You're just going to lose it to the one way smoke. So um teams in general are getting much better at fighting for ramp and it's a bit more bit more back and forth i agree that way too many rounds end on the a bomb site it's just ridiculous the um, the i don't know what the stats are but i bet it's at least 65 maybe 70 a site ending um which just shouldn't really be happening but yeah um it's definitely a lot better than it was um <laughs> it's still not good that's for sure um but it's it's at a point where i can appreciate two top teams playing it and that's kind of all i need to be excited about a match even if um i don't think the actual map is brilliant and that uh we should just get tuscan in or something already and just be done with this so yeah remakes so st statistically 
I would like I, I went into the direct stats of like the top teams on Vertigo maybe three or four months ago. So this might have this might have adjusted, but it was like ninety. It's like eighty nine percent of rounds started with at least three A, and it's like yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know the ending percentages, right? Like, well, I, I I I don't know them off the top of my head, but it's like it literally was just like A and then just enough not A so that you ha can't five stack A. It was like that was literally these percentages were. Only A is what we really want, but we can't technically only go A. So we pretty much only go A. It's like, yeah, that's not that's, that's not a good thing. Like, no. And then this is like my my weekly ability to say, fuck T-sided maps. Like they're broken inherently. T-sided maps break this the CS game, the economy, the way it works. Doesn't work for T-sided maps unless you want to rework it. It doesn't fucking work. Stop making T-sided maps. And then vertical maps, Nuke is a pretty good map. Like, Nuke is a good map. I think it plays well. The problem is, if you were to put as much effort into... Um, if you were to take the amount of effort put into making Nuke good, you could make two good horizontal maps. Instead, <laughs> yeah. you have one good vertical map. Like, you can make a good vertical map. It just takes ten times more effort that you could just no like fuck it just make a vertical like a horizontal map it'll work a million times better it's so much easier there's so much less problems stop with the vertical maps stop with the t-sided maps and fuck I, they're not going to remove it like we already know i mean we don't know but we know mirage is probably next up for getting removed like fuck I want to push a little bit deeper on the the T-sided maps because this is another conversation I was having recently just in general is the idea of the T-sided economy in, as we have come to know it as uh, with this newer system. I think initially Valve's intention was we want to remove the double eco from the game because it's not very fun to watch and it's it is pretty shit I guess like if you have to double eco for two or eco for two rounds like hard eco and then after that you can finally start seeing some action maybe they also just wanted more gun rounds or more rounds where one team had a chance like I don't know what their motivation was but it seems like at least one of their high priority goals was to get rid of the double eco scenario we get rid of that but it's at the cost of having significantly more save rounds than ever before seen in counter strike and I don't think this is just map specific because I think this happens more on Ver uh, inferno and more on um, nuke perhaps, but, uh, what was the other map that I was going to say here? I guess vertigo as well. It is like a vertigo tactic to, to save more often, but I think CTs will almost always be saving in rounds where it doesn't really, um, previously you wouldn't see the same angle taken. And I'm not sure if this is because people have adapted to a new meta or because people are higher skill, because if this is just the way that CS is meant to be played, then it's almost like a bad system in my opinion, just fundamentally, because it's not very exciting to watch three CTs save because two died on A, or even four CTs save because one died on A or something to that effect. Uh, obviously, Dust2, I guess, was the other map I was thinking about the top of my head because of the fact that B-Side is so notoriously difficult to retake. But I just see more CTs than ever before saving, more save rounds in general, and with the bomb timer and the round timer being as long as they end up being which it works fine if there's not going to be saves every round, you have a lot of dead time in the middle of a broadcast, in the middle of a, a game. So th that's sort of my position coming into that. Do we think that there needs to be something done to, I guess in Valorant what happens is if you save, you get less money than if you die and, and respawn. I, I think maybe that would be too much of a gimmick in, in that economy side. But what, what do you guys make of the current system as, as it is? Our team saving too much for, for what would be like a, a more fun spectacle to watch or... Is it even something you guys that's been on your radar? What anybody, uh, pretty much anybody could jump in on this one. Um, I think you're seeing a few teams that uh, I, I mean, I could, I think it could even be abused a little bit more than some teams are doing. Um, I think a few teams like you've got Furia that's, that's done the five, a thing on Inferno a few times. Um, I think those types of things make perfect sense when you see maps that are T sided, especially where it's just like, you're, you're expected to lose the rounds. And when you have a T side that is on, um, like a multi-round loss bonus and they get the bomb planted, they can almost automatically buy. So kind of like take like giving them a round win and taking away that potential rebuy so you can actually build some economy when you do win a round is, is also um pretty relevant, I think. Um I think you could definitely see teams abuse it more. There was actually this setup that um G2 did before they got Nico. I think it was before they got Nico. It was Inferno. They like stacked four four or five A. And then um, Astralis went B, Astralis planted the bomb, and then 
Um, G2 did, did the typical like full save thing where you um, you go in as the bomb about is about to explode and you just try and get people to die to the bomb. But this was on a bonus round. So they all had MP9s and just shit guns. They were going to have a buy up next round anyways. They just waited for the bomb to be near explosion, pushed in. Astralis had four people die. And then Astralis in the first gun round, like the first real gun round, had a kind of shit buy. And, and G2 had like a perfect buy because they were on bonus the previous round. Like I could see that type of thing happening um, some more often on on ct side bonus rounds because you're kind of you're you're seeding the round right but you're you're stacking a bomb site and you're making sure that the economy is in your favor um again i think it could happen even a little bit more with the way the economy is working right now um yeah it, it's not people are definitely catching on to it it's it's definitely people are getting bored of it um i don't know what the solution is though yeah um i don't know i think um in terms of like dead time of team saving and stuff I don't think it's a big problem. I think actually CS in general maybe doesn't actually have enough dead time in a broadcast. As weird as it sounds, just like compared to other games, like it's very hard to build a narrative if you're casting it or whatever because it's just like constantly being hit and it's just like the next round starting. So having 30 seconds at the end of a round to decompress and then to get ready for the next round in some ways can be good. So yeah, I don't see a massive issue in that in that respect. Obviously, the biggest problem in the game is second round four spies T side. They're like an absolute joke. Um, like like losing a CT side, losing the reset round is way worse than losing pistol. Like it's not even close because um, you you can't even get full buy out to like round round five, six and a half. So like the way they intro they change the economy, so it's losing pistol, you get an extra, you start the bonus, you start the loss bonus a bit higher. Like in like they they need to rejig it so that what if you get reset you still get like that one nine starting money or something they've got to change something because it's just ridiculous at the moment how good forcing second is and it's getting to the point where everyone is forcing second even without a plant now to try and get the reset um so it's just getting a bit ridiculous so that's probably my biggest gripe with the economy is the second round resets i think in general we have too many gun rounds a half at the moment um i think so when I'd like demo review games, like it's normally probably these days 10 or 11 gun rounds a half, gun on gun rounds that is. Whereas back in the day, it used to be, I don't know, nine or 10 or even eight if they got full reset a couple of times. So I do think, you know, they, this is another conversation where, where we should go to 12 rounds a half or stuff. There's definitely a conversation with this economy that you should. Mm. Um, but yeah, my make my biggest gripe is definitely set four spies and resetting the economy off the losing pistol. Um, but yeah, um, in terms of like saving and stuff, I don't really have an issue with it. I like I like that aspect of the game. Um, I always liked with the old economy how you play differently um, when you could get full reset, where you'd like you used to like load up bomb sites on CT side if you could get full reset, so you could just save through into the next round. Um, without getting full reset and losing all your guns. And that was like a really interesting part of the game that we lost. Um, so anything that retains that or anything that has more depth just through the economy, I think is good. Um, so yeah, a lot of different points there, but uh, we're in an okay place for the economy. I just want to see the uh, the resets second round T-side change. No, I think that makes sense. That? Go ahead. Yeah, you have a... I guess, I guess he said that you think um, maybe 1,900 even on second round loss. Um, I would just scrap 1,400 as a loss bonus, I think. That's what I would yeah. do. Oh, that would be interesting. That'd be cool. I think that fixes a lot of problems because as a, as a sort of aspiring game designer, my biggest gripe with the economy system is actually that it's just gimmicked. The fact that they start you off at a higher level than you can end up is pretty stupid to me. Like from a systems design perspective, it's just stupid. Like Valve clearly wanted to engineer an outcome and didn't care how, how yeah, they work backwards. Yeah. hundred percent. They work yeah. backwards. And the other thing is like the economy at the moment punishes punishes the winning team if they're getting taken close in rounds. If you're winning yes. rounds consecutively yeah. and you're going down to one on one, two on two, you can get four reset and just lose the whole game. Um, so like, yeah, if you win, if you win like a two or three rounds in a row through one v ones and then just lose one round, you like you might just lose six in a row because you just can't get any money out. So like, yeah, the whole economy system is like a bit stupid and like <laughs> you just change it like the. I thought about this a lot and the, what I would do is probably just go back to the old money and just scrap 1400 as a loss bonus and just try that out. So yeah, whatever, 1900 up to, up to three, three, uh, three, four or whatever it would be. Um, yeah. And I think it would probably work and it would, it would have valve achieve what they want in the first place, which is less full ecos whilst, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it still does still benefit a coherent system. 
it still does benefit the T's a bit more than the CT's if you got 1900 because you get a bomb plant 27 you can always force off a 27 if you really want um but you could I you mean, could skew no it you could that. you could make it T side it starts at 1 5 or 1 6 or you could just up the price of the guns a bit on T side I don't know yeah um, I feel like upping the price of the guns might be a decent idea uh, on T side I know Val Valve doesn't like making it more complicated I don't think they'd split CT and T economy prices that seems like not their style of of change but uh, maybe upping the prices of guns on T side could be a solution. Well, we are living right in now, fantasy right, land, like, Vu. Like, the, the I mean, Valve are like, never going to change any of this shit. Unfortunately, it feels like. Yeah. Well, the thing is, they're fucking probably looking at matchmaking data where it's like, Fuck. oh, well, the T's can't entry into the bomb site. So, like, it's really okay. tough. Like, like that's probably well, what they're looking at. Gotta nerf at. Like, the AWP because I keep <laughs> dying in matchmaking. Uh, uh, who who the fuck knows what they're looking at? But uh, yeah, it's it's not great, especially. It feels it, it feels especially shit like the CT like the T's have like a good loss bonus. They keep getting plants. You win one on ones as CT, so you're playing full buy versus full buy, and you win a bunch of them, and then you just lose one. It's like yeah, we just so basically we won more gun rounds this game, exactly. and we lost the game, and it's like that doesn't feel right, you know? Yeah, no the the issue with CTs in particular, if they get traded close and there's only two or three or even one member surviving, but they still will have like a worse buy on the next round, is like pretty infuriating for me as well. I just feel like when you look at it that way through the lens of the fact that for like you were saying earlier, Vu T sided maps aren't working with this economy. There's like a lot of problems with just T sided pretty much anything T sided economy or T sided maps. Um, while we're on the topic of, of fantasy land changes, like obviously Alan mentioned going down to, uh, first to 13, I think it is right. That's the, the max round or. Yeah. Well, I'd rounds, make my economy 12, change. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than doing that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that option. There's chargers only, which uh, to me is super compelling when I saw the Thorin video on it, where he breaks down why it would be a superior format. Um, obviously that changes a lot about the game, but it could potentially change a lot po for the positive because then. It's okay that the T's get an advantage to score as many rounds as they can if the CT are, are, are only pressured to stop them and not pressured necessarily to score rounds on their own side. Uh, that might change a lot about how that dynamic goes. At the end of the day, it is like obviously kind of magical fairyland, right? But uh, we, we can dream around here in heaven. So what, what do you make of the whole conversation about like as sort of takeaways from the current problems that we see in the, in the competitive scene, Vu? I'm curious as to your thoughts on like... I um. Sorry, no, like, I don't, um, I don't think Chargers only is realistic because of, like, sponsor stuff, you know, you want to know when, like, you, well, actually, Chargers it only should, makes it It should easy. work out better in that sense. Yeah. yeah, it should actually work out better, you're right, like, I, I was thinking about it in the wrong way. No, it, it would be cool, I'd like to see a tournament or two with it, I think it would be a cool, like, one-off tournament format, I guess people wouldn't really, the problem is that, Unless there's enough incentive, pros don't give a fuck about, like, any tournament shit. Like, you know, even if there's, like, fucking 200 grand for first place, they're going to be like, oh, I didn't even know how you're supposed to play this. Like, until we played the finals, I had no idea that this is how <laughs> things work. Like, <laughs> it, you know, it would be cool for, like, a one-off, like, tournament format, kind of like how there was the MR12. Uh, I think it was the charity tournament, right? That was MR12. Um, it would be kind of cool. Um... I don't know. I think MR12 makes makes some sense. It, it definitely makes some sense because the games are getting, they're trending way up in terms of, and, and as you get more, you know, saving, they're continuing to trend up in terms of how long they last. I yes. think it's on, on average, they last an extra like eight or 10 minutes or something now compared to like a couple of years ago, um, which is, you know, going to increase viewer fatigue, um, which is bad for the game, right? So it, I think it, would it also, make a lot of sense. Yeah, it also legitimizes the best of five as a format, which we didn't really touch on for the grand final. But had it gone to five maps, I feel like the, every time it goes to five maps, it's almost never an exciting series. Like, it, no, there's it, never been. There's like there's only been a few good ones ever. Yeah, in CS, <laughs> ever. and and I mean, I can't. I my tr sort of trajectory was from like StarCraft to League of Legends to CS, and in StarCraft, it's like best of fucking fourteen, or whatever, like just absurd, or it's it's best of sevens minimum. So you see a lot more of those kinds of things, and obviously in League, best of five is like the traditional playoff format for a lot. Whereas when we come to CS, I was initially thinking like. What do you? What do these people mean? Best of fives are too long. And then I actually saw the game, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I guess they would be." So that's kind of what we're seeing here: is that the, the best of fives do trend, especially with games themselves trending long. Um, yeah, I, I definitely felt like even that that series uh, 
where Gambit could have two won if it was a best of three final. I think if you make it max rounds 12, then it makes a lot more sense to have a best of five final if that's what you want. Like maybe that would be the major final or something. And that also unlocks the potential to have like more maps or whatever in the pool because then it makes sense for you to, to have like a more prolonged veto or something, which is obviously another topic. But uh, speaking of maps, there was of course that Battle of Betway show match that happened between Big and NIP a while back that uh, Vu has fond memories of saying, I don't want to fucking watch this. And then Maui Snake <laughs> is like, well, I'm hosting it, so I'll be watching it. <laughs> That's a good moment. But no, so there was that, <sighs> that particular uh, matchup that I th- thought was quite um, quite interesting because it actually showed us some maps that we hadn't seen before played competitively. I think if we just get more almost vanity events or, or show match events like that, we might actually get uh, just more ideas explored. Uh, be it format changes or even balance changes, potentially, I don't know, something. And it's enough of like a new spectacle. There's that novelty factor that I think would pull in the viewers to justify it from that angle. So maybe there's something I'm missing from that equation, but it almost seems like a no-brainer. I'm not sure if you have any anything to add on this topic, Alan, or if we'll just um, move on. In terms it. of the charges only one, that is something I've toyed with in my head a lot because sure. it's like, it's really hard to think about how it actually play out with teams because um, you just haven't seen it. And yep. there's so many weird things where... Would they really go super ham and aggressive on T side just to try and force out loads of rounds to try and get it done? I'd love to see somebody try it. Yeah. Um, and even if it's just a one-off tournament, I'd love to see it tried. And that presumably it is possible in the game to actually kind of mod it or whatever you'd have to do to get it to actually run a charges only format. But I'd love to see that um that in general. But uh but yeah. Um I don't know. I'd maybe maybe just don't experiment enough with these sort of things in CS and um i don't know best of five finals i've never liked them i don't think they work i think with in a double limb tournament with a one map advantage it can work so if there's only four maps but even then um i do prefer a veto advantage and keep it best of three for the final um so yeah but obviously for for asl the big the big thing for them probably is just you know watch hours and stuff and a best of five final is going to help that especially when it's their only match on that day so I don't, I don't think there's any world they'd go away from a best of five final with this format. But uh, yes, in general, I much prefer best of threes. Somebody in the chat is saying they want to see a best of seven final. I'm pretty sure a Take TV event in 2015 did a best of seven final. Um, Jeez. It was definitely best of seven or it was best of six with one map advantage. I can't remember. <laughs> I think it was best of seven. It was like mouse sports against, <laughs> I can't even remember, the Hellraisers. I think Hellraisers won. Yes, look it up. 2015, I think it was called, maybe it was Ace of Predator Masters or maybe it was Take TV. I can't remember, but that was genuinely a best of six or seven. And it was just <laughs> like eight hours of CS. Just awful uh, to actually sit for and watch. I think a best of, a best of five, sorry, with a one map advantage is the most reasonable way to do a best of five final. Because then it's only four maps max, which is a good amount of maps, but it's not the end of the world. It's not unmanageable. Um, there's just the question of whether or not a map advantage is is fair or you know the best for you know a format. Um, and definitely, it's one of those things that I think both. It seems like both players and community um, together dislike uh, a map advantage, even though it makes perfect logical sense. You've lost once in the series yes. in the tournament. You come in with a map disadvantage. Um, I mostly I see it more from fans than anyone else that like they're just mad that their favorite team is has a disadvantage. It's I don't know. I, I think it's personally I think it's fine. I guess a veto di- the the one problem with it is like usually you want um okay so the way I see it um, and I think uh, most of the people I've talked to see it is you want to you want to go second in the veto um, because then you know if there is if you both perma veto vertigo for example then they veto it first unless they're going to call your bluff but like you've got kind of the the upper hand there but then if you go into um into a best of five final and you have like the higher um the higher like the upper bracket team vetoes first they also pick first and then you can just have like a really underwhelming final end because they win their map and then they go onto your map and maybe you win it and then they just win the next map and it's like just a really it's really ends up being kind of underwhelming in that way um but I think it, logistically it makes more sense. Yeah, solving for a competitive final while still providing an advantage to the upper bracket team is like the real Gordian knot that we all have to figure out how to untie if we even want to entertain that. 
I, I do think that it doesn't just because it's difficult doesn't mean it excuses best of five finals, but obviously ESL's pitch for higher viewer hours, uh, didn't really help them here. It was the least one watched in like five years or something for I am Katowice specifically, just because probably because of the teams more than anything, I think. So it's, uh, just an unfortunate turn of events for them, I suppose. If we go back to the, that exact event, though, uh, one of the teams that obviously we haven't actually talked that much about is Gambit, since we opened up talking so much about VP and following their quest down from quarterfinals up. Uh, did we have any thoughts on on Gambit? Not necessarily. I think their most interesting match is probably the Navi one, right? Because Spirit Definitely. was a blowout. It didn't feel like they were even in the game, to be honest. And then obviously going into the final, we said pretty much similar things about VP, where uh, Gambit either had completely outclassed them or VP just didn't play very well. And I think we're all kind of uh, more on the VP side of that equation than, than the Gambit side, but they still obviously had to defeat the teams that they had. I thought as soon as we saw... Um, when Navi fell in the quarterfinals, I kind of expected the final itself to be pretty bad in terms of the quality of the games because I knew one of Spirit or Gambit were making the final. And that's almost like one of Avangar or Renegades at the Berlin Major making the final. It's like, you're probably not going to get a, a quality match out of that no matter who comes out of from the other side of the bracket. Unless that happens to be like another team that they're evenly matched with somehow upsets their way in, which obviously didn't happen. Like, I guess the one time that that happened in major history that I can recall was when we saw the the old school gambit against Immortals in the major final, where neither of those teams were particular favorites, and you didn't really expect a good matchup from either of them, and that went to three maps. It was pretty entertaining somehow. Whereas this one, obviously not the case. So if we look at the Navi Gambit side. I'm curious as to how Simple in particular ended up getting seemingly uh, neutralized looking at his stats anyway. He, he just broke even across the series, which normally he's a massive outlier on that. Um, so this is actually a bit of an outlier for him specifically at the tournament. And then the rest of his team kind of went dark. And it was just another event where we see Navi being inconsistent. But with the inconsistent nature that all the CIS teams played at at this particular tournament... You have to wonder if maybe the CIS region is just kind of whack on its face and we just have to sort of throw our hands up and say, is it even possible to analyze this? So I'll throw the challenge to you, Alan, if you can sort of explain away Navi's loss here, because I, I'm certainly kind of speechless myself. Well, I thought the overpass game was really close. Uh, that one could have gone either way, even though Gambit took it. The interesting map in this series was definitely the train game. And what happened on this train game is Navi started off on T side. They ran a few rounds onto A at the start and they just got like, wrecked by like aggressive main control and stuff by gambit so they really moved away from hitting the a bomb site and they must have hit b like six gun rounds in a row as this went late and every time gambit were just playing free b late because they had main control and ends in anything ivy the whole round so like this was a really strange game from my perspective from like a calling and like coaching perspective where it was just all falling apart so much from a strategic level for navi on that t side it was very perplexing and like navi you know, Navi really should be the best train team in the world. There's really no, there's not really much competition for them. They've been very good on it in gen, like if you average out over the last year, but recently, like they've just been ultra inconsistent, losing this game, losing to MIBR, which they should just be smashing, just playing ABCCS. So, like, something's clearly wrong with how they call train at the moment. And then maybe they're not used to these teams playing super aggressively into like main and stuff. But, Navi, they've played so many teams, like they should be used to that. It was all very strange. And in that game, that was one where watching it, I was watching it thinking, like, Boomich and Blade have got to step it up from a calling perspective here. Like, this this just isn't good enough for a team that should be in contention for the best in the world. They should have been able to to like, even if they lost that train game and lost the series, it shouldn't have looked like that on T side. It should have looked like a team was like really throwing the kitchen sink at trying to find a solution to what was going on. Because as I said, they just ran so many B rounds because they were expecting a way too much. So yeah, in that, that series was very underwhelming for, for Navi. And uh, well, I guess from the Gambit perspective, that was like Shiro was just a monster in that series. And if it went one on two or one on one, he was going to win it. So um, he was definitely a factor as well from the Gambit perspective. So one of the things that um, this is actually going heavy B is something I've seen several times against Gambit. And it's actually, I think it's been one of the more successful things I've seen teams do against Gambit on train. Um, so it, it could definitely be, um, it could definitely be more of a game planning thing. But if you look at um, Navi, I didn't catch this train game specifically, but usually it's Perfecto holding Tcon, and they kind of leave him on an island. 
more so than um, a lot of the other CIS teams because all the CIS teams go stupidly hard from what I've seen into TCON. All the CIS teams are really like really heavy on trying to control TCON on T side. If you watch Spirit, they um, I think it's Spirit that have like they toss a Molly down in TCON almost every round. Um, they just use a shit ton of utility on their T side to control it. Um, and and Navi kind of just leave. It feels like they leave Perfecto on a bit of an island, and then that can cause some serious problems if you're running into CIS teams. Where you know if you actually look at it statistically, Navi has been pretty weak against CIS teams in general. Yes. Um, they they just don't fare well against CIS competition, it seems. And with, you know, <clears throat> I mean, that's going to be really tough for them if they uh, if CIS dominance continues, um, if they can't beat their own region. Um, and it kind of makes sense, um, given the way Navi plays and then the fact that, you know, you've got ridiculously strong oppers and like Shiro and, and Dagster um, that are more passive and just kind of holding angles and, and Navi... Um, I don't want to say they're not organized, but any time I've tried to steal a strat from Navi to give to a team I'm coaching, it's always had some flaw in the strat. Like it's always been a not the greatest strat of all time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they typically do struggle against CIS teams. So when you see them coming into a side of the bracket where they have to play Gambit and then Spirit, it's it's you could, I mean, Dweg did predict that they wouldn't make it into the final. Um, I didn't predict they wouldn't make it into the final, but you can see it coming, kind of, you know? Dweg predicted Spirit taking the whole event, so... Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> not quite not quite ringing true on that one, but, you know, good on him. <laughs> good on him for trying. So, yeah, I mean, it seems like... I wonder if this is the case or if this is just me trying to make sense of this pattern that's emerging with Navi falling down to CIS teams a lot. It feels like maybe they're almost too used to the more European ABC style or not even just European, right? Because a lot of the elite North American teams or the one elite North American team plays like this themselves where they, they kind of agree upon certain handshake rules. And then when the CIS mobsters just pull out the, the gun instead, then you've got nothing like you have no answer. So when that handshake isn't taken, you have to wonder like maybe they're falling down because they don't, they're not used to playing that sort of style anymore. Certainly it's not something that they themselves employ too often, but it, it would feel really bizarre if there's no act like, it's undeniable that the the style works against these other teams. So when we see Spirit, Gambit, and VP making the, the top four of this event, it, it's one of those things where we have to ask ourselves, like, well, are the other teams just not adapting correctly to the CIS play style? It just feels weird that Navi would also fall prey to that, being a CIS team themselves, being purportedly the best CIS team. But it seems like that only applies when they're playing against non-CIS competition. So... What do you make of the, the regional rivalry there, Alan? Is that something that's just going to continue to bite them in the ass? Or like, do they have to figure some other I way out? I don't know. The thing about, so the, presumably the most of the stats you're seeing are from like some of the CIS tournaments they had in like the end of last yeah, year. Yeah, IEM New York CIS. Yeah. Hilarious. Number. I remember yeah, watching those games. These wonder, games right? were all played just before Flashpoint. So I watched a lot of them actually. And in those games, like Navi just clearly were not, like, they just weren't, it didn't look right. Like they just weren't dare I say trying in those games. Like it just didn't look like a Navi that I'd seen earlier on in the year, especially at the LAN events. So I'm kind of tempted to sort of just brush aside those results um, just sure. on that basis. I don't know, actually. I mean, the thing about this event is they played Virtus Pro in the opening game of the group stage of the main event and just smashed them completely. Um, just like shut them down so hard. They just couldn't, Virtus, Virtus Pro couldn't adapt at all to Navi's T side in that series. So like, the idea of that they'd just be terrible in general against CIS teams, sure. I, I don't totally buy. And I actually think this series, like that train game was a mega outlier in terms of, I don't think you're going to see that happen many times. And that was when they just got blindsided so hard by, by Gambit. And I don't know if they changed stuff on the B site. Like, um, yeah, I don't know if the Hobbit in previous games was playing it in, in a particular way where he was just going to get wrecked by like B pops or something. But clearly in this game, he was playing fine and anchoring that B bomb site. So I don't know. And um, I'm you know, I, I'm probably willing to bet that in a five events time, you won't look at this storyline of them playing CIS teams badly much. I bet if they play more, it will just even out, um, to be honest. And I think this game was a very strange one and i'm not sure how much they practice each other and whether this was factoring in but um yes i don't know it, i think this game's the outlier the gambit series actually um so um just to say i um when i 
when we were on DreamHack, we had an interview with Hobbit, and we asked a specific question: how much they were practicing CIS teams, and they're saying, or at least they said, you know, this is a couple months ago that um, they mostly practice European teams because they play most of their events against CIS teams, which was kind of interesting because usually when you think of like regional matchups, you're thinking like they practice each other, they know each other pretty well. Um, but apparently they specifically try to avoid practicing CIS teams very much um, because of the region locking. It's one of those things where you're not 100% sure how how well that translates into, I guess that makes sense for why Gambit was able to adapt to the European style. Um, but then they didn't really have to at all. At any point, they were playing CIS teams the whole playoff bracket. So yeah. that, that's the the puzzling thing. Yeah, I guess it, I guess if you if you take the like the specific you know CIS regional events out and you say you know I don't think Navi were were necessarily playing the way they should if they were you know kind of just mentally checked out or something. Um, then Navi's had relatively good results against CIS. Um, you know they did beat VP. Uh, like you said, and then they come into the finals. It's just, yeah, I'm just looking at kind of the, the, the whole situation there where including those events where they've done kind of poor, but they can definitely adapt. Now, obviously the most likely team to adapt to those, you know, if they are kind of struggling at CIS a little bit, um, you know, if that is true, they're definitely the most likely to adapt given their experience and hopefully come out on top. But the fuck. The CIS teams are so fucking nutty, man. Like, they got so many sick players coming out of CIS. It's unbelievable. Like, Dagster just shows up, just dominates. Mir's just on top of the world. Like, feel like he's playing better than he's ever played. Yakindar, he was on Pro Sto. I, guess, I think that's how you pronounce it, right? Like, Oh, the Pro 100 team from Zeus? Or yeah, whatever? yeah, yeah. Supposedly 100 is supposed to be... I've never heard this before, but supposedly 100 is supposed to be Sto. Um... And I, I've played, like, a bunch of games with a lot of Russian people typing out, and I've never seen that before. <laughs> it's got to be some obscure shit, you know, but... Well, yeah, we, um, I'm not surprised by any name from the CIS region after Boomich is not Boombla, so, like, whatever. Yeah, that one makes sense. It This is, like, just the, the most random tangent, but, like, the like these CIS... These Russian players, they, they like... They, there's similar characters in... Um, in the Cyrillic, and then there's like almost makeshift similar yes. characters in in English, where a four looks kind of like the ch sound from like in Cyrillic. So people put a four, and then if you're trying to understand Russian and you're trying to like you're trying to learn Russian, you have people that talk in Cyrillic, and then people that talk in Latin characters, but you like spelling it out, and then you have people like fucking Boomich who do boom blah because it looks like the it's unbelievably tilting if you're ever trying to learn russian it's fucking unbelievable dude unreal unreal scenes man anyways unbelievable that's a reference nobody <laughs> will get unfortunately but what i will say about the uh the whole like russian cis rival the regional rivalry the region locking and all that stuff that we saw coming out i'm almost surprised that it took this long for a bunch of CIS teams to make it to some sort of upper placing. I didn't expect it to go from zero to four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like one, if you count Navi, obviously. But what what really was underwhelming about this event was maybe it's the, the nature of single all in best of threes in playoffs. But for me, when I see Navi defeat a strong, like Vitality when they were not having all of the ridiculous like apex in apex out issues presumably they're still a top team in that event and blast and then they defeat astralis in the same day like both of them best of threes astralis a two zero even that makes me feel like navi are an elite team and then they go and do this and i mean making to quarterfinals in iem katavits if they were below like six other or, or five other teams that were really good then i'd be like oh okay it makes sense like they just got outclassed in that one matchup but it's below gambit spirit vp and liquid liquid's the only one that makes sense to me maybe you can make an argument for vp like coming away from if you if you haven't watched the games and you just see this result but i don't for example i don't think spirit was a top four team at this event that just doesn't fly like they, they did take astralis scalp but and, and you know i guess they defeated heroic and a couple of other teams right they defeated g2 so they took some serious upsets. Um, obviously, G2 has been on a downswing lately, so you can kind of explain away some of that. Heroic obviously immediately made roster changes following this, so you don't know what the stability was like in that roster. 
It just doesn't feel like they played to the level of a top four team, particularly in their final best of three when they were in the semis and they got completely outclassed by Gambit. But just in general, I don't get the sense that they are the fourth best team at this event or the third to fourth best team at at this event. If I had to judge it based on the eye test, I would probably say it's like, you know, maybe Liquid, Navi, Astralis are like the, the top three, maybe VP as well. Um, and, and maybe you could, you know, plus or minus one of those teams out of there, but I'm not sure if it's a fault of the format or if it's just a fault of the regional matchups, but it just felt like we didn't get the proper matchups we were supposed to in the playoffs. And I, I'm trying to make sure that I make that argument where it doesn't sound like I'm just saying my favorite teams or my, the teams that I'm familiar with didn't make it to playoffs and I'm pissed because that's obviously not the case. But when, when you're coming into this as an analyst and you're trying to make sense of the results and then you watch the games and, and the games are as one-sided as they are, and especially in the semis in particular, it doesn't feel like we got the right games, I guess, is, is, is a general notion. So I'm not sure what you think about this, Alan, but throwing it to you. There's a lot. There's a lot of questions on this sort of stuff. With like, should we re? Should we should we be like reseeding going into playoff of tournaments to try and get a good bracket and stuff like this? I mean, this bracket actually was okay if it played out with the favorites winning. We would have got right. like a Navi Astralis or a Navi Liquid final with like great matches. Maybe the Spirit Navi semi might have been a bit lower than we might have expected for a semi this kind of caliber event. But in general, like I think the bracket was fine for the for the playoffs. So. I don't know. In terms of Spirit being a top four team at the event, they certainly looked good in the Astralis series, but that one was a that one's a really strange series. I mean, Astralis picked train in that series. They picked it again into into VP, but even so, Astralis on train is still I'm not sold yet. And I think in that Spirit series as well, Astralis banned nuke second rotation. So there's loads of weird stuff going on with Astralis's map pool at the moment. And um even with the the 16-1 on Dust 2 and all that. Yeah, I'm not sure that's enough to convince me that Spirits, you know, got incredible depth in their map pool or beyond certain certain aspects of their play style, they could adapt against, you know, I mean, we clearly saw it against a Gambit. Gambit perhaps are more 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 attuned to a team that's very proactive, for, in, for instance, on the CT side, and they just fell apart in that series. So Spirit, very inconsistent, looked good in the Astralis series, but I do agree that I don't think they were a top four team here. And Potentially, you could ask questions of the format. Should we be like accelerating people sure. to the semis? Maybe we should have more teams going to the playoffs and have an eighteen playoff, so they had to play another, you know, decent team to get there. I don't know. Question for another day, but uh, but yeah, uh, not 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 a top four team for me. Well, with Spirit taking Astralis as well, that's a match for seeding. They've both been qualified for playoffs. That almost is like priming you to understand or explain away a loss that to a to a team that you're supposed to beat in air quotes right so i think if astralis played spirit again they would probably beat spirits astralis is a good team at at like kind of taking in those losses and then learning from it and going better but i mean even astralis like they just don't look like themselves like alan said you know banning nuke their nuke just doesn't look good you know when when you're looking at their nuke they you know, I went into this. The reason they brought in Boomich, in my opinion, is because, or not Boomich, uh, uh, Bubsky. <laughs> the reason they brought in Bubsky is because their nuke was clearly not doing well. And they, it was just like, well, fuck it. Let's see if this fixes it. And now they've gone back and they put what? Magisk on ramp, I think, when they've played their last game of nuke, or they've said they've at least changed uh, Magisk to ramp. Um, and it's just like they're just kind of trying anything to get their nuke together because without nuke being there, I feel like their map pool is. I mean, it's Astralis, but their map pool is really lacking against a lot of different teams if they can't play Nuke. Um, I feel like that was kind of like the, one of those maps where it was just they were so good on it, and it was the nail in the coffin. If you can't, you know, it's almost like, I feel like they used to be like that on Inferno, where it's like every every series goes to Inferno, and Astralis always win Inferno, right? Yep. And now it's like it's it's kind of like every series wants to go to Nuke. And Astralis, you know, with Esetag, they were 16 and 1 or 17 and 1 on Nuke. And then since Zipnix has returned, they've just been pretty abysmal. I mean, the problem is, from what I've seen, <laughs> the, uh, Bubsky's good on CT side. When he plays ramp on CT side, he's good. Zipnix is lacking. But then on, when you switch sides, on the T side, Bubsky just doesn't fit in well on their T side. And Zipnix fits in pretty well so it's like which one do you choose we've got a clear problem here how do we fix that and they just haven't found a solution so they started banning nuke um i don't know i think they've got clear issues so i think while i think they would have beat spirit i don't even know if um 
I don't even know who the top four would be in my mind if I'm thinking of a top four or if, if Astralis would be in that in terms of their play this tournament. Can, you, can we just take a moment to pray for Bubski? Because when he comes <laughs> in <laughs> before every match and he's like, please, sir, please, Mr. Nyholm, I'd like to play a game. I'd like to play a game for your, your organization as you pay me to sit on the fucking bench. And then he, he, he comes in there and they're like, Oh, he hello, Bubski. Why don't you ask uh, in-game leader Glaive? And he just hits that submit veto button. Nuke banned. Goodbye. You're never playing another game on our roster again. That's what it feels like. Like, why do we when they ban Nuke, they're literally saying goodbye, Bubski. Not even a chance. And then this, this story comes out where he's like, I'm going to play on b a bunch of maps. Well, I'll believe that. Is that when what I he see said? It, like, I can't yeah. even remember. I saw, I saw it, but I can't remember what exactly he said. He said he'd play three or four maps in the end. Said they want to rejig it. Yeah, three or four they, maps like, in his entire career. They fucking mind career. control Bubsky at this point, man. He's like, they they they're not pulling a fast one on the community, man. They're pulling a fast one on Bubsky. Jesus, I can't believe it, man. He was so good on Mad Lions, I, and it sounds I, weird to even say Mad Lions because it's depressing, man. Like yeah. he was such a good player. He had so much potential, and hopefully he comes out of Astralis. Because that's the only way I see him playing games again as he comes yeah. out of Astralis. With maybe he's learned some things, you know. Because even just sitting on sitting in on practice of a team sure. of that caliber, seeing how they operate, seeing how they run things, I think can definitely be a beneficial um, situation. However, unfortunately, losing like how much time has he lost on Astralis at this point? Because it's really just Six lost months time. or something. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. losing that much time in in the development of like a promising player does feel like you know not great but um hopefully he can turn it around when he eventually leaves astralis you know it's got to be soon man unless, unless maybe some other players are out and they're rebuilding the roster because we've speculated about that endlessly on this show how long until astralis's players decide to fuck off for another org given all of the insane like drama that's been happening both behind the scenes and in front of it where they've gotten like an insane amount of flack from the community um warranted perhaps some would say but still like pretty high numbers right so yeah it's uh that's just one of the na the nature of the beast i suppose when you're you're signed to the bench instead of actually being able to play and hopefully he gets out of that purgatory soon in fact i guess we can move on to our more like forward facing side of things because i think we've pretty much handled the, the playoff bracket so looking a little bit more ahead one of the the terms that i wanted to, to ask you guys about was astralis in general because outside of speculating as to when the roster falls apart uh vu and i have, have gone back and forth on whether or not we think astralis are completely out are they are they just on a, on this downswing will they error correct or how would that what would that even look like so i'm curious alan what your take is on astralis in their current form because some people don't necessarily even like remember i guess but obviously they've this five-man lineup has had a crazy amount of success in the last couple of years and even the fact that they were able to come back in the online era where some kind of counted them out in the early stages of that they were able to win a lot of these online only tournaments and they're still able to make semifinals finals in this case only quarters um it's definitely like one of the worst results they've had in a while but i do think that to avoid the recency bias angle we do have to look at at how successful they've been with this core um and, and a lot of it's made it a lot harder because of all of the like a million man roster moves that they've they've been making right they're trying to sign the whole population of denmark so putting that to one side what, what do you think in general about astralis's success as it currently stands and, and do you think that they are just going to be continuing down downward as they have been so far yeah, Star Astralis is a tricky one. I mean, for people that, that don't don't really watch other esports, you know, this five man Astralis lineup probably is the best team ever in esports. Um, I, I don't watch all of them, but I know for a fact that League of Legends definitely makes roster changes too much, and same with Dota and stuff like that. There's just no way their their teams could have such longevity. So yeah, it's very hard in the first place to even discuss a roster move with this team because. <laughs> You're putting a lot on the line if you change out a player. Could you even get back to that level? I don't know. Um, the way I look at it, this team is that I'd be very surprised if they change any of the five before they hit lands again. I, I think they're even even if it's just like they're tricking themselves, I think they will just hold out for the lands and try it out for a few and try and get back to a good level again. And I don't really have any doubt they could do it again with this five-man lineup. I don't see why not. If only they were winning tournaments, what, two months ago? And the game hasn't really changed since then, particularly. It's just, you know, you just meet a load of different teams in the playoffs and they play different ways and maybe they aren't ready for that. 
So I don't know. I don't know with Astralis. Um, I mean, last groups wasn't brilliant where they lost to uh, Big and Big and Nip. Yeah. Didn't look great there. So I don't know. I don't know. To be honest, I have a bit of bias kind of because I do. I have always respected the Astralis a lot for how they play and how they approach the game. Always playing the playing the like the the uh, the percentages and all that. Yeah. Always trying to make the high the high percentage decision in every single case. And like having really strong fundamentals, which is what Astralis have won all their majors off of. It's not individuals. It's having rock solid team fundamentals, understanding in every situation how to get the most out of it and how to play them really well and how to have really great communication and team playing. You know, players bouncing well off each other and always, you know, closing out man advantages, always bringing about man disadvantages by making a shrewd information play. Like That's why they had so much success and that hasn't gone anywhere. They still are going to have really strong fundamentals. So that's why I find it very hard to count Astralis out. I think even worst case scenario, this lineup's probably top five. Um, worst case, even if right now they're having some issues, um, I don't see how they could drop out of being top five without the other teams stepping it up a big time. And especially with Vitality and Apex stuff, you know, there's not that necessarily that much competition for the top end right now. So yeah, if I was in the Astralis camp, I wouldn't think about a roster move right now. I'd play it out. I mean, if they were going to make one, it'd be Valde coming in probably um, for for Magics potentially. Um, on the Nuke topic, the problem they've got on Nuke is that on CT side, ramps become a rotator spot over the last like eight months, nine months, yes. maybe half a year. So now it's a rotator spot. Now you have the best rotators in the world all playing ramp. And that's why Zipnix has problems. So they try to get Bubsky in to play, play it instead. Bubsky can play more of a rotator role. He's more comfortable moving around, whereas Zipnix is more of a static player. And then as Vu mentioned on T side, Bubsky can't lobby Lurk like Zipnix can. So it's just a bit of an odd scenario where presumably now they want to do it. Magis plays ramp and Zipnix still plays lobby on T side, which could work. So I'd like to see it play out. Um, I still think they could be a very good nuke team. We'll have to see how it how it goes. But uh, but yeah, I wouldn't make changes as far as Astralis, but we see how it goes, and in terms of a team, the expectation is for Astralis to be the best in the world, and I guess if they have several months of not being in contention for the best in the world, then maybe we'll see a roster move, but if I had to put my money on it, we'll see this this lineup at the Stockholm Major, and then after that, if it doesn't work, they might make a change, but yeah, I'd be surprised if, at least before the lands, they made, they made a big decision. I mean, I think it is confirmed, right? It's I think it's come out on like HLTV confirmed as well that like they were like Zipnix was potentially going to go to another team, like yeah. instead of Esete going to another team. Yeah. Um, I think it, what what's kind of funny is that like from both sides of that trade, it Esete leaving Astralis has not fared well for like Cloud Nine. Esete doesn't seem to be doing that great on Cloud Nine, and um, <clears throat> Astralis has been, you know not doing great i mean not it's not that they're not good but i feel like esetag was definitely doing very well on their roster and i think they'd be doing better with him on the roster um because of the versatility he has over someone like zipnix who i think is kind of um kind of set set in a specific role with what he can do and although he does you know the clutch minister role pretty well um i'm not sure if that's um quite bringing them to the level but i mean yeah it's it's, it's how do you count to straw us out right like they're the greatest team of all time, right? Like they've they've come back from slumps before, very clearly. Like the Blastralis era, they came right back. They did just fine, right? So it, it's really hard to count them out entirely. If making a roster move at this point seems kind of pointless. Um, I don't think that would be. It's just too much of a risk, isn't it? Yeah. Like, when, yeah. I when, mean... when when even a few months ago they were playing as one of the probably the best team in the world, why would you pull the trigger now? You just they need to have a prolonged period of significant issues, I think. Yeah, I think you give that team as long as they want with their five until they really believe that they can't do it. Because it seems like a roster that will would is also kind of real. I feel like they'd be they'd be willing themselves to admit if they can't make it work with that five, and they, they'll probably know what that looks like. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get a VP repeat where the old Polish VP squad took forever before they made any roster moves, and by that point it had been well and truly dealt with, like. They should have done it a lot sooner. Uh, it does seem like Astralis are a little bit more, or the players anyway, should be a little bit more realistic about that. As we turn our attention to the last topic of the show, um, my main question really is if we'll even have a best team in the world. Like Alan obviously touted Astralis a couple months ago or just, even just one month ago as as potentially being that. But I feel like 
I'm kind of with Richard Lewis on this one. He's been pretty vocal about this being a parody era once again, uh, which we had a, maybe a couple of years back, but in a little bit of a less de- in-depth way where it was just a couple of teams, like two or three. This time it feels like the pool of teams that can win tournaments in 2021 is much higher. And I think a lot of that is probably down to the fact that there are no lands and there's a lot more intangibles surrounding these games uh, as we saw play out at IM Katowice. So I suppose, Alan, I'll throw it back to you here to answer our last question first. If you have any uh, thoughts on, on essentially which teams you would be watching to take a lot of the trophies, or if you even believe that there's going to be a spread, if you think there's going to be one who's going to be dominant, any uh, any predictions there? It's a good question. I mean, over the whole year, I'm still willing to bet there is a team that comes out as, uh, as a consistently high level, whether it's Astralis getting back to a good level or Na'Vi, this being an outlier and Na'Vi more consistently being a top, top two team at tournaments. I think in general, I'd look at Na'Vi. I do think Na'Vi are the best team in the world right now. I do think the Gambit result was in some senses an outlier. I do think they are a much more complete team than people give them credit for. Um, And even though they play a bit differently. So for example, earlier on, Vu mentioned that like, don't nick Na'Vi strats, which is pretty true. <laughs> um, they, it's because they like play a lot and they, they call a lot on the fly and like all their late round hits are basically on the fly um, and stuff like this. It's just the way they choose to play the game, they like to give the individuals more space than other teams. So it's not necessarily that Na'Vi can't be a really great tactical team. They just choose to play in a particular way, I think more so than anything. So yeah, Na'Vi is definitely the team that I think will probably come out of at least the next few months as the best team um at least if you average it out will they be mega consistent i'm not totally sure i think you'll see them in top four in a lot of tournaments you know, over the next few months um but in terms of being a solidified number one i mean in general you have to kind of also say that we've kind of been um we've kind of been deluded into with Astralis and potentially Liquid for a period of having a very solid what number one team that just wins like 10 events in a row and is dominant for like several months. Whereas if you look back in the history of CS, it's pretty rare. And even for a team like Fnatic in 2015, like they weren't just the best team consistently in every single event and just winning everything. Like they had sure. their had their issues. They had TSM for a period was the best team in the world. Towards the end of the year, you know, uh, VP had some good events and NV came, came alive into that major run and stuff. So even for a team like that, which you kind of consider in the same light as an Astralis, they didn't just win every single tournament. <laughs> they weren't just... The, the Astralis are kind of the outliers where for periods they have just literally won everything and Liquid on their um, Grand Slam one run did literally win everything. So, um, and someone's asking me in chat if I've heard of Nip. Yes, that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, they got Nip. they got your boy Mahone on the roster now. He's uh, <laughs> he's, he's making the moves. Are you spoiling think, future um, episodes? What are you doing here? So, so one thing you said, Alan, is um, about Fnatic. Like, I think most of the teams, um, most of the teams historically that have been number one have still had like Kryptonite opponents. Like you said, Fnatic, yes. Fnatic had TSM. And then I remember back then it was like this huge thing. Fnatic, I think it was like Fnatic won six events in a row, I think. It was like six or seven events in a row. And that was like this huge thing. And now you've got Astralis. And it's like, well, if you don't win like six of seven <laughs> events, like you're, you're, are you really a solidified number one? Like, you know, uh, I think if Navi won this event, um, if, I mean, if Navi won this event or came second, I don't think this would really be that much of a discussion that they're sure. like clearly the best in the world, you know? Um, and they just lose, they look really dominant in the groups. They lose one best of three. They're out and, you know, they're out in. Well, two, they quarters. did lose to liquid, right? So no, liquid. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. They're, they're out in, they're out in quarters and it yeah. looks like a lot worse than it, than it really is. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be tough to get a team that's like just coming out, especially when the tournaments are so often just like back to back to back to back. Um, online especially where it's just like it's way harder if you're like if you're if you're not on point it's way easier for your opponents to just destroy you aim wise um, and Navi has some players that aren't always going to show up on point you know to a, a, a specific level um, if I was to guess in the next few months probably I'd guess Navi stays on top but yeah I mean if, if we're talking about parity um, that's probably relatively like I, I'd say I expect some level of parity where it's just not like a, a, a dominant first place team. Um unless Astralis come back, or I mean even Vitality come back, like Vitality. I feel like Vitality is 
I've got a lot of hope for Vitality. They did pretty poorly. They they were clearly on the downswing, but like that that team, I feel like they have the supporting staff that Astralis pretends that they have. Like they've got like a really clear kind of situation going on there. Certainly could be the case. It seems like they are certainly implementing the uh the, like it's almost like Xtaz is the new Zonic in that respect in terms of coaching where he is he's pushing things much farther along and then obviously if you consider um the support staff being able to activate their sixth and seventh men so to speak uh they definitely have a more robust roster in that respect which is really interesting so um yeah it's definitely something to keep watch on i would say what, what uh, do you yeah, really make of it on on vitality like i would I just wouldn't be surprised if in a few events they just turn up and like <laughs> top three again like at all it's kind of the same as the astralis argument like how could how could Vitality not just be good after we've seen a very consistent like level of them over like the past year or so, um, at least with this lineup? So yeah, that Vitality is one where whatever's going on there with Apex, or whether it's burnout or whatever or personal problems, I don't know. As long as they get on top of that, yes, they have very good coach, good 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 all good support staff, fairly good system of using subs and all that, like. Yeah, I think they should be able to turn it around to some extent. Can they be at best in the world? I need to see it on the server. But sure. um, if I'm judging it just on what I saw from Vitality at the end of last year, sure. If they get rid of what, if they get over whatever problems are going on with Apex and stuff, I see no reason that they couldn't be the best team in the world. Really, if, uh, if they just get in a good place and you know get back to playing the kind of CS they were at the end of last year. Because, I mean, the other thing is like Vitality probably were the best team of last year, even if um, Astralis won whatever the. Uh, the HLTV said they were the best. It probably was Vitality at the end of the day. Um, but actually on the Na'Vi topic, something I've come around to thinking is like, without the pandemic, I do think Na'Vi would have been the best team of last year. And I think they could have won a major. Um, I looked at how they were playing at Katowice. I looked at how they are playing at the start of this year when they really started coming back together. And I'm like, draw a through line between that and not have the pandemic. And this team could have get, nailed in some massive tournament wins and, Give them two tries at a major, and maybe you know, simple finally gets his major, major trophy and all that. So I feel like that's kind of cheating, yeah. though. Like uh, Navi is like the team where if, when they hit their peak, they're going to be probably the best team in the world, and there's not much you can do it. So if you're like, yeah, if you take one peak and then you take another peak and you just draw a straight line, yeah, like, true. You know, true. <laughs> um, it's true. But... I do think I do think you're right, though. You know, like I think the land to online thing, I think it really hurt. It, it seems like I think Navi's a, a team with players that like. I, I don't know how motivated someone like Simple or Electronic can get for online events. I think when it when it came to Cato last year, they looked fucking. Uh, I think it was Cato last year right? where they yeah, looked yeah. unstoppable. Yes. Yeah. Um, they just looked incredible. And then it goes online. It just seems like it was like the air was taken out, or the wind was taken out of their sails almost. Um, I think the online switch, um, probably hurt them pretty bad i i do think I, I i predicted them to win a major last year um if it was on land i think they definitely could have um if there was a major maybe yeah, yeah yeah well that's that's something we have to hope for going forward uh that we we i don't think we ever covered it on this specific show but obviously the pgl major over in stockholm should be uh should be a land just like all of the esl events should have been a land so hopefully it actually is a land unlike those ones we can uh we can hope so yeah, I, I guess that brings us pretty comfortably to the uh, the end of the show here, Alan. So I'm not sure if you have anything in particular in the in the can that you want to shout out ahead of time, or just want to shout out your your YouTube content and your Twitter and all that. But certainly a pleasure having you on the show, and appreciate you joining us so late on in your time zone. It's not too late. I mean, I'm gamer and all that, so whatever okay. <laughs> doesn't really matter. But whatever, Twitter, YouTube, check me out. Check these guys out. Let's have some fun. Let's yeah. have some fun. <laughs> I like that. That's that's what we do up here in Elo Heaven. So there you go. Anything for you to shout out, Vu? I know you just released a video. Uh, you got it. There you go. That's, that's it. That's it. Shout out sponsors of that video in particular. Leadify.com slash Vu. There you go. And of course, Ridge Wallet. But wait, did you ever figure out if it was yeah. Vu or Vu CSGO? Do we, do we even know? Uh, uh, for Ridge Wallet, I have no fucking idea. Okay. Uh, who cares? Just, just put one of those in if you end up buying that. Uh, weapon of a wallet and that'll that'll do it for us so thanks for joining us alan and thanks for joining us viewers we'll be back sometime next week most likely for yet another episode of this till then